Hello, and welcome to this special recorded event, Decision 2024, Your Voices, Your Future. My name is Tom Guevara. I'm director of the IU Public Policy Institute, and I'll be your host as we hear from the three candidates vying to be elected as Indiana's next governor. It's an incredible honor to moderate such a critical discussion about the future of our state. Much of the work and thanks go to the staff of the IU Public Policy Institute and the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs for making this event possible. This is the fourth time our institute, which is part of the Paul H. O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs, has hosted this forum, and I am pleased to participate in the conversation. I also would like to thank the Heron School of Art and Design for allowing us to record this form in their beautiful school. I'm here because I'm a Hoosier who wants to see Indiana thrive in every way possible. In fact, all three of our guests share this desire for our state. I would like to thank our candidates, former Indiana Superintendent of Public Instruction, Dr. Jennifer McCormick, U.S. Senator Mike Braun, and Mr. Donald Rainwater for their participation and ideas. Many critical questions and issues will be raised during my discussion with the candidates. Public discourse is one of America's most proud traditions, and I am so pleased that you are joining us to hear from our candidates. Each candidate will be with me individually for approximately one half hour without the usual trappings of partisan elections. This is not a debate, but rather a discussion about their vision for our state. Earlier this year, the Public Policy Institute embarked on a process of drafting a series of policy briefs that cover critical topics that impact Hoosiers on a daily basis. I will be speaking with the candidates on a number of these important issues, including but not limited to child care and health care, workforce development, innovation and technology, and community resiliency. I'll be asking questions that have been derived from this work with the advice of faculty members and students at the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs in Indianapolis and Bloomington, as well as expert authors who have collaborated with us. With the 24-hour news cycle and social media at everyone's fingertips, it can be easy to focus on headlines and not substance. This form is designed to be different. The goal will be to proceed in a conversational tone with a spirit of open inquiry in keeping with the mission of the Public Policy Institute. We will hear from the next governor of Indiana on important issues that we all hear about regularly and the Policy Institute studies every day. I look forward to a spirited discussion about the future of our state and I appreciate you being here to be part of the conversation. Please welcome the Libertarian nominee for governor, Mr. Donald Rainwater. Mr. Rainwater, thank you for being here. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be able to do this. Well, let's go ahead and jump right in and let's first talk about confidence in institutions. During the last three years, the Gallup organization has reported a large decrease in the public's confidence in our most important federal government institutions. While Indiana state government may not face quite the same loss of confidence as federal institutions, it also is likely not immune to it. What do you think can be done to raise Hoosier's confidence that our state government can effectively address their needs? Well, uh, you know, I've seen and heard a lot of folks express their uh, concern. Uh, and I believe that uh, that is one of the foundational reasons why I'm running for governor in the first place. As an everyday average Hoosier, uh, I am very concerned about the fact that my state government seems to be less interested in the uh, safeguarding of individual rights for Hoosiers and more interested in courting large corporate entities uh, to move here. And so I think that one of the first things that we have to do uh, as a state government is uh, refocus and, and really uh, recommit ourselves to government of, by, and for the people. And in doing so, focusing on the individual rights of our citizens and putting our government's focus on developing the uh, small business owner, the family farmer, 
uh, an economy, allowing an economy to grow uh, where the rising tide truly does lift all ships. Uh, because today, I think most average Hoosiers hear people say that the economy is doing well, but it doesn't look that way in their bank account or when they sit down to pay their bills at the kitchen table. So I think that is an important part of what we can do. Economic research shows small and new businesses create most new jobs. In 2022, the Indiana Community Action Poverty Institute found low-wage jobs dominate in rural areas. Although not a universal solution, entrepreneurship can lead to more jobs, lower income inequality, and build wealthier communities. What policies or programs can we implement or support to help Hoosiers who want to start a business? Well, again, I think the first thing that we have to do is shift our state government's focus away from uh, providing incentives and tax breaks uh, to large corporations from outside of Indiana and start focusing more on uh, the individual because an entrepreneur is an individual. A small business owner is an individual. Uh, someone who uh, purchases a franchise and starts a franchise is an individual. What we're doing today is we're bringing in uh, a large quantity of these uh, corporate jobs and we're actually encouraging the workforce to leave our small business owners and go to these large corporate jobs. Um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, I believe in August of 23, issued a report saying that for every 100 available jobs in the state of Indiana, we're about 23 workers short. And what we have to do is we've got to refocus on the small business owner. Uh, I believe, um, and I don't remember where the statistic came from, I apologize, but uh, over the past decade, we've actually had a net loss in small businesses and um, franchisees. And so we really need to refocus on the individual and, and stop courting, if you will, uh, the big corporate entities and, and focus on how do we uh, encourage entrepreneurship. And one of the things I think we have to do in order to do that is we have to take a really good hard look at uh, professional licensing in the state of Indiana, in a lot of the regulations uh, around uh, creating certain types of small businesses and make it easier for people. You know, a lot of times we talk about government trying to create an incentive, and I don't think we need to incentivize as much as we do get out of the way. Evidence shows that technological innovation elevates wages and incomes and our overall standard of living. Indiana has a large manufacturing industry that employs about 20% of our state's workforce, but innovation and technological advancement in manufacturing is lagging particularly in rural areas. What can we do to increase opportunities for Hoosiers to work with artificial intelligence and in tech-intensive advanced manufacturing? Well, as a software engineer for the past 25 years, I, I can personally attest to the fact that technology and innovation creates a lot of opportunity. Uh, it has created a lot of opportunity for me. Um, one of the things that I believe that most economists agree on is that jobs don't bring people, people bring jobs. So as we just talked about, uh, when you have a worker shortage of about 20 to 25 percent in the state of Indiana, the, the issue isn't bringing jobs to rural areas, it's bringing people that are ready to do those jobs. And one of the things that I've learned over the past 25 years is you don't have to have a college degree 
to get the training to take advantage of the innovation that is available today. And so one of the things that we have to do is we have to uh, do a better job of informing our citizens of all the different avenues of gaining that, that new skill, uh, whether it be uh, Ivy Tech or whether it be just uh, certification courses and getting certifications and getting some on-the-job training. And as we get a workforce that is uh, well-informed as to the opportunities, and then a workforce that is uh, getting that training, and here again, it doesn't take a four-year degree or a master's degree or a PhD. What it could be is just a, a six-week course uh, and a, a certification exam to get your project manager management professional certification or some other certification that gives you that uh, foot in the door. Then those jobs will start coming to the areas where those people are. And I think that that's one of the things that we have to kind of here again refocus on. We're so focused on bringing jobs that we, we don't focus on how to encourage uh, new residents to Indiana, and I think that's something we need to focus on. Indiana's maternal and infant mortality rate has exceeded the national average since at least the 1990s. For every 1,000 births in 2022, seven infants died before their first birthday, putting Indiana at the seventh highest position for infant mortality in the nation. Rural Hoosiers and Hoosiers of color, in particular, experience inadequate maternal and infant health care due to a lack of physicians, hospitals, and specialty services. How can we improve Indiana's maternal and infant health outcomes while also reducing racial and geographic disparities? Well, you know, this is an issue that was a question that was asked four years ago. And so the first thing that we have to realize is here again, our state government doesn't seem to be addressing this issue. And one of the reasons that I think that is, is because healthcare is a complex issue. Um, I, I, part of the problem that we have, and I'm gonna go back to our uh, professional licensing. Uh, we have a shortage of midwives in Indiana, and uh, we need more midwives. Uh, because in many of these areas, whether it be an urban area or a rural area, um, our, our large corporate health care facilities uh, and organizations, uh, for whatever reason, don't deem it profitable to provide uh, health care in these areas. Uh, you unfortunately find that uh, doctors cluster together now um, many times because health insurance costs and the overhead involved in um, a provider dealing with the insurance company makes it difficult for them to be independent. They have to kind of network together in order to split the cost of um, the overhead involved. And so I think there, there are a couple of things that we need to do right away. One is uh, get nurse practitioners, midwives, uh, make it easier to get into that field. Uh, here again, uh, a lot of that is education, post-secondary education is way too expensive. We need to figure out how to make uh, the educational opportunities more affordable for people. That's a complex issue that we can't solve sitting right here, unfortunately. Um, but there are things that we can do. The professional licensing, making it easier uh, to maintain a professional license in the areas of healthcare, 
um, making it easier for the, what I will refer to as the old country doctor, right? The doctor who would actually come to you. We don't have that today. We've got to figure out how to make it financially viable for healthcare professionals to be able to provide the type of services. I think we're starting to see that with direct primary care. Uh, I think if you look at um, being able to go to a Kroger or a Walmart uh, to get um, care uh, from a clinic, but here again in a lot of the areas we're talking about, there are no Kroger's, right? Because your healthcare desert is also a food desert. And there's an issue there and we've got to figure out. And here again, it's not, we can't just keep taxing people over and over and over more and more and more and then saying we're going to take this money and give it to somebody to go do this because that won't work. That's not sustainable. But uh, we've got to start addressing these problems where they are. And the reality is, is we don't have enough people who are able to provide health care in an affordable way to these particular groups of people, whether they be urban or rural. And, and we've got to get together and focus on how to do that and stop focusing on how we create regulations that increase the monopolies of the large healthcare corporations we have today. And there's nothing wrong with the large healthcare corporations we have today, but we also have to have, if you will, the mom and pop, the small business, the entrepreneurial healthcare provider that can afford to meet the regulatory burdens, uh, burdens and, and be able to provide what, what people need. So let's turn to housing. Indiana has a deficit of nearly 140,000 affordable and available rental homes, with only 34 units available for every 100 of the lowest income households, the second lowest rate in the Midwest. Additionally, in the last year alone, Indiana had nearly 71,000 eviction filings, nearly one in 10 Hoosier renter households. What investments are needed and, as governor, what strategies would you employ to make housing more affordable in our state? You know, I, I read, I think it was yesterday morning, that uh, it is now in some parts of the state cheaper to buy a house than it is to rent one. And I'm going to say we have to start with property taxes because uh, real estate investors are not going to pay rising property taxes without passing that cost on to their renter. And the reality is, is as property tax assessments keep going up so that the government can collect, whether it be local government or, or county government, uh, they want to collect property taxes so they can go do a lot of these vanity uh, projects uh, that don't necessarily help the individual citizen. Uh, and the reality is, is that those property taxes keep going up. That affects renters, in my opinion, probably more harshly than it does a homeowner. And homeowners, we all know how harshly it affects us, right? And when you look at uh, your property taxes, whether here again, you're a homeowner or an investor being escrowed into your mortgage, if you, are, if you have your rental property on a mortgage, then that represents 100, 200, 300, maybe even $400 a month. And so if you're passing that on to a renter, that's hard to handle. And so in my opinion, the first thing we need to do is address property taxes and get that under control. Uh, and not just for the homeowner, not just for senior citizens or veterans, and I, I'm a veteran, uh, but for everybody. Every Hoosier homeowner, every Hoosier uh, real estate owner who has uh, renters, uh, 
uh, we, we need to address this for everybody because it affects everybody. And uh, we also need to look really, really hard at why we have the continually rising housing costs that we have. This is an element of inflation. And inflation, here again, most economists will say in one form or another, they'll say that uh, the basic cause of inflation is government spending money we don't really have. And whether it's the federal government, the state government, your county government, your local government, this idea that it's better for government to spend money than it is for you and me to spend money is backward. So we've really got to, uh, here again, refocus on what's right and what's best for the economy, not just what's right and what's best for uh, a group of politicians, donors. According to the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority Housing Dashboard, the home ownership rate for black Hoosiers was 38% in 2022, compared to 75% for white Hoosiers. Black Hoosiers have been the only racial group to experience a decline in their home ownership rate since 2012, due, in part, to past discriminatory practices and policies. As governor, what steps would you take to increase home ownership opportunities, especially for black Hoosiers? Well, I don't know if the governor can do a lot to fix that problem other than here again to call out what I think is an underlying uh, an underlying cause of the problem. Most of the areas where black Hoosiers are affected by this are areas where our, our local county and state government have ignored the area. They're so busy trying to build um, the donut counties, for example, that uh, you know we're we're ignoring uh, probably about ninety percent of the state of Indiana, including most of Indianapolis, uh, and it's because that's not where uh, they want to uh, spend the money. It, it's and it's a shame because the original purpose of the tax increment financing district and the redevelopment, it's even in the name, Redevelopment Commission. It's not a, a new development commission, it's supposed to be a redevelopment commission. And these tools were supposed to be tools designed to help reinvigorate areas that were economically hurting. And so what we've done is we've seen that over the past 20 to 30 years, tools that were originally designed to help these very areas and to increase the economic growth in these areas, here again, as the economy grows, folks are then able to hopefully make more money, save more money. And when you can save more money, you can buy a house. Um, but we, we don't see that. What we see is these property taxes and other, uh, other taxes being spent uh, on areas that are already pretty affluent. And so here again, I think we need to refocus what the purpose of tax increment financing and, and redevelopment commissions. And if we're not going to spend it the way it was intended, we need to do away with it and give people their money back. So let's talk a little bit about child care. The first five years of a child's life are critical for brain development of our young Hoosiers. Research shows that access to affordable, quality child care can enable more people to work. To set the stage for Hoosier children's future educational success, how should families' access to high-quality care and learning opportunities be expanded? Well, that, that's, that's a subject that concerns me because one of the things that I hear uh, from both uh, the Republicans and the Democrats is that they want to expand um, universal pre-K. Um, 
And I think the assumption is, well, you know, we need to provide this so more people can work. Well, not everybody wants to work. Some folks would like to stay home and actively take care of the development of those first five years of a child's life, uh, not hand it over to the state of Indiana, because unfortunately, in my opinion, and what I've heard from here again, both of uh, my opponents, is that uh, you know they want to have more control over uh, how your children are taught uh, from not just kindergarten through 12th grade, but now from birth uh, through, through five years old. Um, I, I'm gonna be very honest, that concerns me. That's, that's not really the kind of thing to me in a free society that, that we wanna get in the habit of doing. So I think here again, what we need to do is, if we're gonna focus on how to make childcare affordable, we need to first of all look at what regulations we have created and what hoops uh, child care providers are required by state government to uh, jump through in order to be a child care provider. Um, it's very important that we make sure that we have some oversight to ensure that child care providers are providing good quality child care, that they're not neglecting or abusing children, and I understand that. But here again, we as a state government have uh, created a habit of uh, creating regulations that favor some and are really barriers to entry for others. And this is something that we have to analyze and do away with because creating a barrier to entry so that there's less competition drives up prices. If we create more competition and we allow people to get into the, you know, here again, professional licensing and um, all of the things that go along with child care providers, I think then we can see a lowering of cost and making it more affordable for people. Because here again, the regulations, or over-regulation if you will, is what drives up the cost. And government can't fix that because government is causing that. Government needs to remove some of those regulations. As in the rest of the country, Hoosiers are experiencing the ever larger effects of a changing climate, including more extreme and frequent weather events. Multiple surveys have found that most Hoosiers, regardless of political party, support policies that help address climate change and do more to develop alternative energy sources. What policies do you think are needed to address climate change? Well, here again, from a, from a scientific standpoint, I'm not an expert on cli climate change, obviously. But I believe that um, whatever we are contributing to it, uh, we need as a state to look at opportunities uh, to make uh, more sustainable energy choices. Now, being uh, a Navy veteran, I would like to see us uh, do more research and spend a little more effort uh, on the idea of nuclear energy. Uh, there, I, I believe there are about 669 uh, nuclear power plants worldwide, uh, and there have only been um, a, a very small, like 32 um, incidents of people uh, being injured or killed in relationship to nuclear energy. So a lot of the um, concerns that people might have about safety, I, I think uh, we can do a, a better job of letting folks know that this is, you know, this isn't uh, the 1980s. Um, I'll say that we've got uh, nuclear submarines and, and nuclear aircraft carriers uh, working safely all over the world uh, in our Navy. And so I think that that is a, uh, 
an energy source that we should be looking at really, really strongly to help uh, to reduce some of those climate issues. According to federal reporting, only 37% of all Indiana schools met or exceeded expectations during the 2022-2023 academic year. Recent state assessments also revealed that only 30% of students were proficient in math and English language arts. What should we do to improve equitable education outcomes for students across the state? I'll try to keep this brief. We need to do away with state standardized testing. We need to let our teachers teach. We need to decentralize education in the state of Indiana and flatten our bureaucracy. And by that I mean we need fewer administrators, fewer layers of uh, bureaucrats in education and more teachers and teacher's aides in the classroom teaching as when I was a kid, they called it reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? The three R's. And that's what we need to focus on. And we've gotten so far away from that. Education is a political football in this state. And we need to do a Tom Brady and take the air out of that political football and get back to teaching kids. Nearly one in 12 Hoosiers meet the criteria for having a substance use disorder. Access to early intervention and treatment services not only saves lives, but also reduces the economic impact of addiction on the individual and the community. What can your administration do to ensure those individuals have continued access to necessary recovery and treatment services? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is uh, recognize that addiction is not a crime and it should not be treated as a crime. Uh, under a rainwater administration, I would seek, first of all, um, to ask the General Assembly to decriminalize and legalize cannabis. Uh, I would expunge the records of anyone who had been convicted of a nonviolent cannabis related offense. Uh, people who are addicted to alcohol, to other, um, you know, prescription narcotics, uh, non-prescription narcotics. Um, first of all, we have to recognize these are not crimes. It is not a crime. It is a medical condition. And we need to be able to encourage people to say, hey, I have a problem. I need help. And not be concerned that uh, they're going to be incarcerated uh, because they have an addiction issue. Indianapolis has the fifth highest imprisonment rate in the nation for black men born to low-income families. Researchers have found that racial disparities in the Indianapolis criminal justice system are a leading cause. What should be the top priority in addressing racial disparities in the Indiana justice system, and what will your administration do to implement policies to reduce them? Well, again, I think that, you know, we've talked to about a couple of these things that are, are causal to this. One is how we treat um, people who uh, use cannabis. Two is the fact that because our state government is focused on uh, spending money in places where they don't need to be spending money, uh, we're not uh, we're not giving people much hope in these areas, especially in the ur urban areas that we've kind of turned our back on. And we're not uh, encouraging, we're not creating an environment where those economies can be reborn. And one of the things I think, you know, we talk about violence in our cities. And I think that once again, um, that is a symptom of people who have no hope. And they have no hope because their government has turned their back on them. And because they feel like the government takes and takes and takes, the government is constantly there to try to incarcerate them, and they have no, they have no way out. And so we have to refocus our government on 
reducing government's influence on creating these situations. Because here again, uh, you know, I th Reagan said two things that I think are, are really, really poignant today. One is here again, government is not the solution to the problem. Government is the problem. And the other was that the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Because most often, they're not and we've got to change that. Indiana is historically among the bottom states in voter participation, particularly for young voters. Has your campaign engaged young voters during this election cycle, and what can be done to increase voting in our elections? You know, and I'm gonna answer that by saying that young voters have engaged my campaign. Um, I have seen a large number of young people come to me, whether it be at a county fair or, or somewhere else where I'm um, meeting voters, and young people 18, 19, 20 uh, will come up to me and they'll either say, I, I wasn't old enough to vote for you in 2020, but I'm voting for you this time. And it's because, because they'll tell you that the Republicans and the Democrats, they've listened to them spout stuff and uh, nothing changes. And they believe that maybe there's an opportunity for change. And they see that in our campaign. And I think that that's important. And I think that uh, that's an opportunity for the um, new voters to make an impact. Mr. Donald Rainwater, Libertarian nominee for governor, thank you very much. We appreciate your participation. Oh, I appreciate the opportunity. Yes. And certainly good luck in the rest of your campaign. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for these important discussions with the candidates for Indiana's governor. One of them will be elected to lead our state for the next four years, and it is my hope that these conversations will help inform your decision this November. To the candidates, Dr. McCormick, Senator Braun, and Mr. Rainwater, we wish you the best of luck and thank you for joining us. A special thanks to the Heron School of Art and Design at IU Indianapolis, and especially the school's dean, Greg Hall, for their gracious accommodations and support. A special thanks also goes to the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs, whose students, faculty, staff, and alumni continue to make this forum an important event during the fall gubernatorial campaign cycle. And to the incredibly hardworking staff of the IU Public Policy Institute and our O'Neill Marketing and Communications team. You can learn more about the policy briefs used to inform our discussions at policyinstitute.iu.edu. If you have not registered to vote, the deadline to do so in Indiana is Monday, October 7th. Election day is Tuesday, November 5th. No matter for whom you cast your ballot, please exercise your right to vote. Once again, thank you for joining us.